You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Tony Guerra. Uh, he's a pharmacist. He's also a professor at Des Moines Area Community College in Iowa. So, Tony, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, it's a pretty good afternoon here and, uh, you know, excited to be on. Well, great. Tell me a little bit about, um, you know, you're a pharmacist and a professor. What are your interests? What are you working on? And what, what engages you? Um, mostly it's, uh, turning books into audio books. I think people are really busy and, uh, it started maybe 2016, uh, where I, I wrote and created my first audio book. And, uh, this was back when Amazon was providing, uh, significant, uh, revenue streams to, uh, or audible was providing significant revenue streams to authors, uh, in terms of if they got someone to join audible, uh, then they would get, uh, this, uh, bonus or whatever. And at first it, you know, made ten, fifteen thousand dollars the first year, but then it kind of blew up to closer to fifty thousand a year. And I recycled that money into writing more books. And so now I'm closer to twenty audio books and uh now instead of just helping with pharmacology, one of the classes that I teach uh in college, I also uh, I've worked with other people, uh Eric Christensen from MedEd one oh one on pharmacotherapy books, two of them. Uh TLDR Pharmacies, Brandon Dyson, uh, worked on a residency interview book with him, Blair Telemeyer, uh, pharmacy consulting business book with her, and then uh, really just the four biggies, uh, pharmacology, pharmacotherapy, you know, your career, and then for some people getting into uh, pharmacy school, but that's not really the priority. It's really helping uh, with people's entrepreneurship and their uh, entrepreneurial road uh, as they're kind of uh, very busy with both their job and their side hustle. Are you writing the books or are you taking the existing books and voicing them over for audio? I've written uh, all but three of them. Uh, I didn't write the two that Eric Christensen wrote and I didn't write the one that Blair wrote and I co-wrote the one with Brandon Dyson. Uh, But all the other ones I've written uh, and really it's just I'll put up a YouTube video that's maybe helpful and all of a sudden it gets a certain number of thousand views and I'm like, oh, that's maybe a road I should take. And some of them work out and some of them don't. So, for example, uh, recently I wrote a strong residency letter of intent. Uh, I'd put up a video on uh, letters of intent and it got, you know, a couple hundred uh, then a couple thousand views uh, in just a couple weeks or so. And uh, I've got close to 20,000 YouTube uh, subscribers. So uh, that's somewhat significant when, you know, you have a significant portion of your group watching it. So, uh, but I've written them uh, for the most part and then uh, like partnering with people as well, if it makes sense and it's something that they don't want to do, I take over the audio and then we just kind of split the revenue after. Yeah. I'm a very auditory learner as you probably are too. And it always is frustrating when there's a book that's only available on Kindle and, you know, hardcover. I think all books should be yeah. audio, too, because a lot of people just want to listen instead. Yeah, and, and kind of a hack uh, in terms of the technology that Amazon uses is that if you are an author, especially if you're like an author speaker, and you only have a book, then there's no voice when you go to the Amazon page. But if you have an audio book, 
you get up to a five minute introduction and it doesn't have to actually even have to be part of your book. It can just be an introduction to the book or to your topic. And you just can't compete. If you've got two equal books, one book gets to talk to the person and one book doesn't, uh, then you certainly get an advantage. So uh, not only because people want to hear audio, but also because it really gives you a tremendous advantage uh, if you're having trying to get organic traffic to your book. Uh, if it can talk to you, uh, it's going to be in much better position. What would you recommend an author talks about? Should they just read a sample from the book or how should they frame that, that five minute audio to make it more effective? Uh, you want to take, uh, so I only write nonfiction books, but you want to take kind of a lesson out of fiction, which is uh, to start in the middle and you want to start and the most exciting thing. And what authors are usually afraid of is that someone's going to take their big idea and then they're going to steal it and then they're going to run with it and then they're going to lose it. But what you do is you just take, well, you've got these seven great tips and you give them two and a half of them. And then just like when you're going down a Facebook page and you only get half the page, you got to see what the next half of the page is and the next half of the page. And so you want to not only have a great hook, have a great engaging story, but also stop in the middle of that story. So they have to pick up the book to get the rest of the story or maybe even the end of the story or at least that third tip. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So here's two tips. If you want to get the rest, get my book, you know, ABC, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it makes sense. It's good. So Amazon's platform lets you uh, do five minutes and put it up there for free. Is that what the benefit is? Or just, you know, how would that no, work if I wanted that, to do that for a book I did? Right. So you would have to create the audio book. And as part of the part of the and as part of the upload process, you've got your introduction, which is, you know, your title and author and publisher and all that stuff. And then you've got your outro. But then you've also got a five minute retail sample. And that five minute retail sample is where you put in that other part to kind of introduce them to you. But it doesn't have to be so much about the book. It can also be about your public speaking. It can also be about what value you give. It can also be about a number of other things. So you can be very strategic about what you want because what you're basically doing is giving them a five minute intro to you and you can lead them to a site or you can lead them to a funnel or whatever you want to. But it doesn't have to end there. And what you can do is you can give them something else that's free that's maybe longer that they can continue to listen to then they can buy into what you are, whatever it is that you want to, you know, provide. The only service I provide is uh, everything else. I just sell books, but the only service I provide is helping uh, graduate students with their letters of intent and uh, statements of purpose. But uh, otherwise, uh, everything I do is product. Do you recommend that the author reads their own book, or is it better to have a professional voice it over for you? It depends on your voice, but uh, in general, if you're re if you're in nonfiction, you want to read your own book, but because it does take a ton of time, and I'm cash heavy and time poor because I've got three kids and I've got a lot going on, so I've had all of the books read by someone else except for the most recent one, which I did, and it was only an hour long, but. If you're in consulting, if you're in speaking, you should absolutely read your own book. But because I'm really not in consulting and speaking, I'm in product, really, uh, then it makes more sense for me to hire a professional. And, and it's not uncommon for three to $400 per finished hour to be what it costs. So a seven-hour book will run you about $2,100, $2,400. Uh, and then in terms of what it would cost you if you record it yourself, uh, that's about $75 an hour. So you're talking, you know, just a fraction of that, maybe, you know, get closer to $700 or $800. So if it's your first time author, you're not sure, I'd record it myself for sure for two reasons. One, it's cheaper. And two, because your audience wants to hear from you, they don't necessarily want to hear to a great version of you. Well, what if there's um, someone famous in your field and they're willing to read it and they have a good voice? Or if there's, uh, you know, someone that's just got like a fantastic voice, like, you know, like James Earl Jones used to or does. Or, <laughs> wants, uh, or someone, you know, you know what, yeah, what I mean, done, like, Darth, if Darth Vader comes comments. over and wants to read it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And, and that's that's kind of a um benefit reward. If you, if you happen to have a friend in your circle that uh, has that kind of gravitas and people would want to hear them, uh, then they also become kind of the target of the book. So it takes attention away from you 
and or it might take away attention from you. It kind of depends. But in general, if I had access to a celebrity, I would probably actually work with them to write the book in such a way that it would make sense for their persona as well as mine, rather than just saying, hey, you're famous. Can you read my book? But you really want it to be an extension of yourself. Uh, and then one mistake I see authors making is they assume that an audiobook is just a red version of an ebook or a print book. A print book should have its own audience. Maybe it's back of the house sales for a public speaker. Uh, an, an electronic book should have an audience in terms of clicking to certain sites that you want them to go to. And then the audio audience is for the person on the go, so it should be cut up in such a way that they could do it just like a podcast like yours, you know, 20 minutes at a time, very short uh, chapter so that they can uh, continue to follow along and not get lost in the details. So three different books is what you want to make sure that you get out of print, ebook, and audiobook. Well, that's interesting. So how different would you make uh, an audiobook? Can you call it the same title? Like how much of it has to be the same in order to be the same title? And do you just say, oh, it's the audio version of your book? And I mean, I, I guess say more about that with some of the uh, ways to do it, right? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll give you an example. So there's two, for example, the, the pharmacology books that I, I sell, the audio book would be terrible if it followed the book literally, you know, word for word. So what you have to add to the book is a more story and kind of frame facts within it, like, okay, well, this mnemonic comes from this and it makes it a little bit more interesting. But if you're naturally writing kind of stories of people that maybe you've helped with your business or you've helped with your technology, then that already lends to an audiobook. And what you might want to do is do it word for word because it'll sell better if it's identical to the book because then you'll get a cheaper price on Amazon. It'll be linked up. Uh, as WhisperSync uh, to the ebook, so you can stop reading the ebook, go right to the audiobook where you left off at the ebook. So it really depends on the topic and if it makes sense. But if you're telling stories and you're a business person and you're uh, telling great stories of people you've helped, then probably read it yourself and read it word for word and write it as a script when you're writing the original book. So ideally, you do the book, you write it, you speak it exactly to do an audiobook version, then you alter it, and then you do an, uh, I guess, I don't know what you'd call it again. You you want the exact replica on audio, but then you also want this additional thing you're saying, right? Yeah, and I always start with the ebook because I, what I do is when I'm creating the audiobook, it also filters this kind of an editing process like, wow, when I said that, it didn't really sound very good, or man, it just kind of muddled here. Okay, let's change the audiobook, let's cut this out, or let's change the ebook, let's cut this out of the ebook, let's put the, work this into the audio. Okay, so now the ebook is perfect, the audio is perfect, now we'll put the print book out there because it's a lot more difficult to fix a print book. So while traditionally people think, oh, I'm going to create this print book, then I'll keep create an e-version, then I'll create an audio version, you actually want to go electronic first, use that audio time to listen to how it works and get other people to listen to it and see where it kind of stops and maybe the energy you know, kind of dips a little bit and you know, punch it up, whatever you need to do. Then after that, then you get the print book uh, and do the print run. So uh, again, it, it may be counterintuitive, but that's what I found works the best in terms of sharpening what you've already created and then making that uh, process of working with a professional narrator uh, even more profitable by making it just sound so much better when you can change the script as they're kind of going through it. Yeah, that's the good stuff. I mean, we want the non-obvious stuff that will help. So that's great. It's great advice. Um, <clears throat> how about the promotion part of it? Do you work in that area or is that left to other people? Yeah, so I'm just a little guy. I'm closer to 100 a year in terms of my side hustle. So uh, I'm not really pulling in uh, you know seven figures and things like that. So I have a strong YouTube presence. Uh, I have a strong Twitter presence, but obviously that's kind of uh, not really <laughs> the platform to be on uh, where I'm a bit weak is certainly Instagram, uh, but I'm somewhat strong on Facebook too. So in terms of promotion, I really uh, use my podcast uh, to kind of uh, 
promote the book, but also talk to people that would be using it. And then in terms of YouTube, uh, that's when I do my launches. Uh, every time you write a book for Audible, if you keep it as an Audible exclusive, they'll give you 200 free codes uh, to give away. So that's a ton of people. If you've got a list of, you know, even a couple of hundred people, that's a lot of people that can write reviews for you. That's a lot of people that can talk to other people about it. And you still get paid for the book as if it got sold. So uh, those that really starts you off with basically 200 sales from whatever book, whatever length. So they've really kind of set it up in such a way now that if you've got a list, uh, you've got, you're going to be successful with the book regardless. Well, when you say Audible exclusive, does that mean the audio version's Audible exclusive or you don't put out a yeah, print that, version? No, no. That means the uh, audio, you can either go Audible exclusive, which means it only goes on Audible and iTunes and you get 40% of any revenue from it. Or you can go wide. That is, you can sell it anywhere in the world, you know, for, um, and then you only get 25% of the revenue instead of 40%. Uh, but I've been exclusive with all of my books just because... I don't really have tremendous wide reach, uh, although my podcast does go to like 50 or 60 countries. Um, my reach is really, my, I'm really niche uh, to U.S. Uh, nursing, pharmacy, and medical students. So because of that, it doesn't necessarily make sense for me to go wide. But if you stay with Audible, they'll give you enough free codes and enough revenue from those books that you actually can, if you read them yourself, you actually make a small profit by creating a book, reading it yourself, and getting it to your list and getting those 200 sales in. Hmm, okay. Interesting. <clears throat> no, it makes a lot of sense. Huh. I guess the whole world of uh, doing these the right way and promoting them and everything. So that's, that's good insight. Uh, what about the, uh, the topics you talk about? Like you said, they're very niche. Do you find that people, I mean, I don't know. What's an example of some of your audiences? Like who would want to read things about, let's say, pharmacology or, you know? Oh, yeah. So that's uh, that was kind of the first big quotation fingers hit where uh, nursing students don't generally have chemistry before pharmacology. So there's a big kind of gap in between. And because of that gap, this kind of fills it in so that as they're going to school, uh, as they're going to classes, as they're commuting, uh, they can kind of listen to it. And there are 3 million nurses. So it's, although that's not the number of nursing students, that's a much bigger population than the 300,000 pharmacists. So the reason that does well is because there are just so many nursing students and pharmacology was really, it's really one of the two classes that really just are really uh, tough for them. The other big hit, if you want to call it a hit, is the the residency interview and then uh, phone interview survival trip tips because an interview, much like public speaking, is something that is very time dependent and the consequences of doing poorly are tremendous. You know, you don't get the job, you lose all that money and all that stuff. So failing pharmacology is a fear, failing the interview is a fear, and I don't right to people's fears. But what I'm finding is that if you want to solve a problem and you want the book to sell, then you find something that is really, really hurting someone and or really, really scaring someone. And you just go in and do your best to help them with it. And that's what the two best selling books I have are. They're there to help students who are worried about pharmacology and failing it. And uh, we've been able to increase the pass rates, uh, just this is anecdotally, uh, but by about 10%. Uh, with just listening to the book on the way and back to school. And then in terms of the interviews, we're hearing uh, good reports that people are getting residencies, people are getting jobs uh, by not making some small mistakes that maybe they didn't think about as they were kind of going into it. And then they're a little bit better prepared. But my yeah, that's great. best great. advice is is to pick something that's uh, really a pain point. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so what is it specifically that you'll do? You'll do the reading for people or will you do the, um, you know, the method of actually creating the book? Like, again, what do you do for people? Oh, it depends. Like I'm, I just write my own books, but if, for example, if I was working with you on a book, then I would take an existing book that you have that you didn't make into audio. And I would either hire a narrator or I could narrate it myself. Uh, I would also do the editing uh, to make it for the ear, I guess is the, the industry buzzword. 
uh, if I wanted to do that. Uh, and then we would just share revenue of uh, the, just the audio portion of it. But really what uh, the only service I provide really is, again, that doing residency letter of intent, helping uh, with editing of something like that or uh, statements of purpose. Uh, that's just something I can do relatively uh, within a window of time. There's a season for it. And uh, it's not something that doesn't take too much away from, you know, my, my regular job. So uh, really, uh, the audiobooks uh, were a side hustle that just happens to make a full-time income. Okay, well, that's great. That would be a good book for you to write, you know, how to make a side hustle into a full-time income. I'm writing that as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you've done it, it's a great proof point, and it's a cool story, too. So, you know. No, I know. I just never actually said it out loud. But as I'm reading, I'm like, wow, how to make a side hustle that makes a full time living. OK, I'll work on the title. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, very cool. So what's the best way for uh, for people to get in touch and to, uh, you know, to avail themselves of your services um, to check uh, out what mem- you put out memorizing there? Memorizing. Sure. Uh, memorizing farm dot com, but memorizing P.H.R.M. Uh, dot com is my website, and uh, there are a ton of free book codes that uh, your audience can get there. Uh, just go to memorizingfarm.com dot com forward slash free book codes. Uh, there are books in pharmacology, pharmacotherapy, uh, residency and career, uh, college interviews, uh, and there are a ton of book codes uh, that they can get there. All right, that's great. Well, Tony, I appreciate you coming on, and uh, you know, we'll talk about maybe having you back to talk also about uh, pharmacology and the technical work that you do. So I appreciate being here. Sounds Thanks. good. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.